Welcome to the A New Body Insight Podcast, empowering and inspiring your journey to optimal health. Hosted by Dr. Supatra Tovar, clinical psychologist, registered dietitian, fitness expert, and author of Deprogram Diet Culture. Rethink your relationship with food, heal your mind, and live a diet-free life. And Chantal Donnelly, physical therapist and author of Settled, How to Find Calm in a Stress-Inducing World. We follow our guest's journey to optimal health, providing you with the keys to unlock your own wellness path. Tune in and evolve with us. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the A New Body Insight podcast. I am Chantal Donnelly, and we have a very special episode for you today. We're mixing things up a little bit. I am actually interviewing my co-host, the amazing Dr. Supatra Tovar today. Very exciting. Actually, I think she called it grilling her. So I don't know, maybe we can roast her. We'll see. We'll see how things unfold. (laughs) (laughs) I'm ready. All right. I'm sure you are. All right. First thing we got to do is read Supatra's bio because you all want to know more about her. I know you've been hearing her interview lots of fun people, but you probably want to know even more about what she does, what she's all about. So let's get into it. Here we go. As one of the only licensed clinical psychologists who is also a registered dietitian and certified fitness expert, Dr. Tovar teaches clients how to use research-based techniques in behavioral psychology, nutritional science, and exercise kinesiology to overcome complex challenges. She harnesses the different disciplines of her unique background to show her clients how small modifications to daily habits can transform mindsets, enhance personal relationships, and accelerate professional trajectories. Dr. Tovar has helped clients navigate through trauma, eating disorders, depression, anxiety, and grief. All important things. Dr. Tovar founded ANU, which in case you're all wondering what that stands for, it stands for Advanced Nutrition and Emotional Wellness, ANU, to offer simple routines to improve your mindset, your health, and your spirit. The flagship online video course, Deprogram Diet Culture, I've been through this course, people, it's good. This course guides participants through the successful seven-step method Dr. Tovar has employed to help clients break free from the destructive cycles of dieting and weight gain. A condensed version of the course is available as a book. Okay, now this is very exciting because this book that Supatra wrote is coming out in September, y'all. It is coming out. It is coming out. The book is called Deprogram Diet Culture. Ready for the subtitle? Ah, I got to take a deep breath. I'm going to start again. I think this. I think this book needs. It's like da 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 da. Here's the title of the book: <laughs> Deprogram Diet Culture. Rethink your relationship to food. Heal your mind and live a diet-free life. It's coming out in September. Going to be published very soon. I'm so excited for you about this book. So Thank excited. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a journey and I'm very excited for it to come out. I am too. I think the world needs it. So thank you for being here to answer all of my grueling <laughs> <laughs> questions. Yes. Um, let's start with maybe how... Can, can you define diet culture for our listeners first? And then can you talk about the negative impact that diet culture has on our health? And what are some signs that maybe somebody is impacted by diet culture that they're struggling with it? Well, I think what's really interesting about diet culture is how it has morphed and shifted over the years. Um, we can pretty much pinpoint the beginning of diet culture to be around like the 40s and 50s, but it really goes back further than that. If you go way, 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 way back in history, actually being plump, uh, having extra weight 
was something that was desired because it proved that you had wealth. It proved that you had access to health care. It proved that you had access to food. So it's always been about um, society's kind of structure in terms of culture, who's kind of on top. Um, and then it wasn't until, you know, the, kind of the industrial revolution when poorer people started to have access to, you know, better nutrition, um, and started to actually gain weight that the higher classes wanted to find a way to kind of distinguish themselves apart from the lower classes. And that's when kind of the hourglass figure in the Victorian age with corsets and all of that stuff, uh, really started to uh, become more, um, you know, desired, um, sought after. But really when, you know, we hit kind of the 40s and 50s, that's when it really took off. So it's it's really about the pursuit of a, an idolized, uh, idealized and idolized thin ideal, along with having, um, you know, kind of another pervasive bias take hold, which is bias against people who have weight, you know, or considered overweight or considered obese. Um, so it's really about trying to pursue that route and eschew the, you know, more overweight or obese route. So you can see this in society in every thing that we do. You can look at uh, media and you can look at, you know, people who are considered overweight and, and their portrayals on it in television and commercials and things like that. They're always kind of, you know, maybe made the butt of a joke or derided or commented upon while the thinner, more attractive person, you know, gets the man at the end or, you know, you can see it all throughout advertising. So it's really in many ways, uh, uh, a media and capitalism driven culture where we just are kind of constantly made to feel like we're not good enough. And if we do X, Y, and Z, maybe we can join this elite class. So that's kind of the history of diet culture. And honestly, I forgot the second half of your question. <laughs> <laughs> I did too. Let me see. What was the second half? Oh, how do you help someone? Um, oh, oh, I'm yeah. sorry. No, no, no. It was, what are the signs? What are the signs okay. that someone has diet culture? Well, I think we all do. I, I really do think it's, it's completely mm. pervasive. I, don't I do. Think that I know I do. Yeah. We all do. I mean, we really, um, you know, but somebody who's very much entrenched in it, you would see somebody who might be dieting all the time, who is very concerned about their appearance. And so they're going to get, you know, Botox treatments or plastic surgery. You might see, um, you know, somebody going to extreme measures in terms of exercise. Uh, anyone who's really focused on trying to achieve this ideal, oftentimes to their own detriment or to their own distress, um, impairment of functioning. So I see a lot of people in my practice who, you know, especially young women um, who have been very much influenced from an early age, especially through social media, um, it, to pursue this thin ideal. And I often see the, the outcome of that. And that's usually through disordered eating patterns and eating disorders. So that's one of the main ways that you can, um, spot somebody who, who might be suffering from this. But really it, it's, it can come down to looking at someone who might purchase numerous things in order to try to achieve this ideal, whether it's supplements, um, you know, diet foods, certain types of clothing, it, it's, it's a very negatively driven desire. And usually it comes from not necessarily just wanting to fit the, the thin ideal, but trying to avoid being classified in the overweight or the obese category because of the way that people are treated. Um, in the country and in the world who are overweight or, or who have obesity. Yeah. That connection with the history of capitalism and how it all ties into this diet culture thing is really interesting and how your economic status is so important to everybody. And I imagine one of the signs might be just, just the spending of money to look rich. Yes. Um, 
can, yeah, exactly. Like just all of that added into needing to be thin. And like you said, spending money on the, the diet foods and the supplements and whatever the guru is telling you, you need to purchase. Right. 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 Exactly. Ah, all right. Um, we know that diets fail. I mean, I yes. know that. I don't know if the whole world knows that, but hey, diets fail. Can you diets explain, fail? Diets fail. Can you explain to us why diets fail, and then what you might offer somebody as an alternative to a diet? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Um, physiologically, the body does not like to be in any kind of restriction, and this goes back to our evolutionary history. We had gone through many periods of deprivation um, to having, you know, access to food to deprivation. So when we're in a deprivation type of uh, physiological state, the body is actually really trying to hold on to whatever it is that we have when a diet is started. And usually if you just look at the nature of diets, they're always, you know, trying to cut something out. There's always something that you're cutting out, whether it's Right now, it's all about cutting carbs, which makes me sad because we all love carbs. Uh, but it's <laughs> it's gone the gamut in terms of, you know, the different types of diets or, oh, you can only have grapefruit <laughs> or you can only <laughs> have cabbage soup. And this was designed so that you lose weight quickly. Well, you actually you do when you're in deprivation, but the body you know, to, to quote the book, the body's keeping the score. The body's like, oh, no, 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 no. You've lost this much water. You've lost this much, this much lean muscle. You've lost this much fat. And it is actually recording it and, and trying to return you back to that same proportion or more when the diet started. So there's a whole bunch of processes, and I won't go into the, the nitty gritty of them, that your body goes through when you're in a deprivation kind of a state. Um, but really, it's when the diet is done, that is when the body kicks in and it goes through a process called compensatory hyperphagia, which, you know, if we were to break it down, compensatory means to make up for hyper means lots and phagia means eat. So essentially you just eat a lot. You eat a lot after right. you've had a it diet. Makes and sense. Yes. Makes and that's the sense. body, body doesn't feel safe. It's going to try yeah. and make up for that. Yeah, exactly. So going through, and I, I've seen people who've gone through cycle after cycle of diet and weight gain only to come back to where they started, if not more. And so I really try to educate people that dieting to lose weight is never the answer. And also what you're doing when you're dieting is you're essentially ignoring your body's signals. And the body does not like that. Our hunger hormone um, and uh, our fullness hormone, namely uh, ghrelin and leptin, but there's a whole bunch of other hormones that are involved in that. Uh, ghrelin, like the gur in the name, is telling you when you're hungry. And when you deprive yourself, ghrelin levels shoot up because it's like, hey, Hey, I am hungry. And it's trying to tell you, please, please, please feed me. And then, you know, your leptin levels, you know, you're never going to actually feel like you're full. So they become out of balance. And the way to actually get yourself out of this cycle, along with a whole bunch of other things that I go into in the book, but just physiologically, is to actually listen to your body. It's actually to honor when you are feeling hungry and when you are feeling full. But a lot of people have a lot of difficulties in this area because they have been conditioned to think that food in general is shameful, which makes me sad, along with cutting carbs. It's like food is like life to me. And it's, it's I think, one of the most important things that we can focus on in, in our daily lives. Um, they're conditioned not to want to eat food. And so they ignore their hunger signals. Um, oftentimes too, if, if it's on the other end of the spectrum, they're eating out of, you know, need for comfort, stress relief, um, out of a lot of, you know, ingrained and older uh, difficulties in their attachments and trauma in their background. So it's a combination of learning how to tune into your body and addressing those issues um, in a non-nutritional kind of way, which can be through therapy, which can be through meditation, through mindfulness. There's a whole bunch of ways where you can learn how to tune into your body 
And that can be the start of your journey away from diet culture. I hope. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It all makes perfect sense. That yeah. need for the body to recoup that weight because it's not safe to yep. lose weight like that. That just makes yes. perfect sense. Yes. Um, and it makes sense that listening to the body with curiosity, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yes. And just really sort of paying attention and that maybe those hunger signals won't be so intense for people if they start to listen to the body and not make the body feel like it's really got to scream and shout to get you to eat properly. Yeah, there's a whole, I think, process that my clients go through when they actually give themselves permission to eat. I think it starts off with guilt and shame. And then when they really start to do this on a regular basis, they see that actually when they do listen to their hunger and when they provide themselves whatever it is that their body is telling them to eat, uh, you know, and, and usually what I'll see them being more successful in is if they're kind of staying within the whole foods kind of realm, then they start to see, oh, well, it's not just that I'm listening to my hunger. I'm listening to what this food is doing inside my body. Oh, I have some energy. Oh, I feel better. My mental health is improving. And that motivates them. I love it that it is an internally driven process as opposed to an external process, which is what diet culture is. And so Mm -hmm. that's how I help people move Mm -hmm. away from that influence so that they can listen to themselves finally and trust themselves. And so good. So good. I love Mm -hmm. that. Me too. I love that. More internal, less external. Yes, please. Guidance. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, okay. So listening to your hunger cues and your satiation cues are going to be one way that I imagine someone can sort of deprogram themselves from diet culture. What are Mm -hmm. other ways that people can help themselves to get out of that? Yes. I have a bunch of tips. Um, I really do think that advertising is a kind of um, insidious, uh, well, it is just it's what fuels our capitalism. So I got to give it to them. But really, when you look at the basics of uh, the type of manipulation that happens in advertising, it is essentially designed to make you feel like you have something you don't have something that you need that this you know company this product right. can provide you and it can be very manipulative you can see the effects that it has on children especially mm-hmm. as they are very very into marketing to children so that they have an influence in terms of what the parent buys in the store and if you look at really what is being influenced it's usually you know some ultra processed you know junk usually um foods that are not necessarily nutritious. But if you look at advertising in general, uh, that is what is kind of pushing us to make all of these purchases. I recommend people to stop subscribing to certain like fashion magazines, um, you know, the diet and health magazines, especially I encourage people to hide uh, advertisements that they might find in their social media. Uh, Try to, you know, remove all of these influences, though it's very, very difficult. Um, And, you know, now that we're into streaming services and things like that, it's much easier not to see commercials, but, you know, really trying to move past them as quickly as possible. I also think social media is one of the biggest drivers of diet culture. So I don't say get off social media. I'm on social media. You're on social media. But Mm -hmm curating your feed can be really important. The algorithm then just starts to bring you more and more of what you are, you know, attracted to. So if you're watching, you know, what I, what I eat in the day or, you know, my before and after photos, you're just going to get more and more of that. And that's going to affect you in a negative way. So I like to follow people that are inspirational celebrities that, you know, are outspoken against diet culture. I like to follow influencers who like to, you know, break them all. I also love puppies and kittens and all sorts of animals. <laughs> so when you look at my my feed, it's really inspirational. And I think, you know, I've, I've helped a lot of teenagers 
recurate their feed to see a very, very good result. So I think we have that control. A lot of people think we don't. Um, and a lot of people consume social media just kind of, you know, blindly without even really thinking about it. But when you do, you're intentional about it. It's really important. So that's one, another way. And I also think we have to be really mindful, especially as we are trying to heal ourselves from diet culture, the connections that we have with others, uh, really discerning if they are positive connections or if they're really like negative influences, like people are telling us, you know, you got to diet with me or you have to come and exercise, you know, excessively with me. I'm not saying end any kind of relationships. I'm saying maybe create some boundaries where you can decide when it's healthy for you to be around that kind of influence and when it's not, and and really being particular about who you're spending time with as you're healing. I find it really, really important for me just personally to surround myself like with, you know, amazing, smart, beautiful from the inside out people who really don't uh, spend a lot of time in that area. And so I think just really kind of looking around at the relationships you have around you and deciding who to spend more time and who to spend a little less time with can really help you as well. I am so excited for this book. I think it's going to really help a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I have to be honest, you know, having you as the interviewee and no longer my co-host, you're usually the one who keeps time. So I have no idea if we're out of time. Or we're not. almost out of time. <laughs> Excellent. And that would be the appropriate time for me to say to you, uh, Dr. Supatra Tovar, can you tell people how they can get in touch with you, how they can learn more from you? Are you on Instagram? Do you have a website? Do you have workshops? What's going on besides this amazing book that's coming out in September? Well, I do have the online course, which is called Deprogram Diet Culture. It's the extended version of what, you know, I talk about in the book that is out right now. And you can access that on a new dash insight.com. The book is coming out in September, but you can find it already on Amazon and pre order it. Oh. So I invite you to do that. Oh my goodness. I know it launches in September. So I'm very excited about that. I have a lot of, uh, you know, podcasts and other appearances coming up, uh, which I will, uh, you know, let people know about on my social media. I have two different handles. I have at Dr. Supatra Tovar, D-R-S-U-P-A-T-R-A-T-O-V-A-R on um, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, threads on uh, LinkedIn as well. And I also have um, at my.anu.insight. That is on all of those same uh, social media uh, platforms as well. So there's tons of ways to get a hold of me. I also have anu-insight.com and I have drsupatratovar.com. So, you know, send me an email, DM me. I'm available and I like to talk to people. So I welcome you. Yay. And everybody go pre-order her book. Yes. It's coming out before, when is it coming out? September. Do you have a specific September. date? I think it's September 9th. September 9th. All right. Yes. Um, well, yes. if this is, it, we don't know when this is going to be released, but if either go buy it or pre-order her book, I think it's an amazing tool for anybody. We all have a messed up relationship with food. I don't know anyone who doesn't have a messed yes. up relationship with food. Diet culture is pervasive. And I think that deprogramming diet culture is super important. But thank you so much for this amazing interview. And I hope that your interview and my interview helps our listeners get to know us better and kind of are able to relate with us and know our history and know that we're doing this podcast to help in all aspects of health. I think that's what's the wonderful combination of you and I is that, you know, you have the physical therapy, the stress, you know, insights. I have nutrition and psychology insights. We both have a history in fitness. And so I think it's such a great combination to be able to help people find their own path to their wellness journey. Yeah, for sure. That that pretty much encompasses all of it, what we bring to the table. And then we're both basket cases. So, you know, we relate that way too. Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is why we've been friends for 23 is it that? Years. 23. All 23 right. 23 years. We just dated and ourselves. counting. All <laughs> right. And on that note, thank you all so much for joining us. And we look forward to you joining us in the next episode and continue to evolve with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for tuning into the A New Body Insight podcast. Please remember, the content shared on this podcast is for entertainment purposes only and does not constitute medical advice. You can find us anywhere podcasts are streaming, on YouTube at my.anew.insight, and at anew-insight.com under the A New Body Insight podcast tab. Follow us on our socials at my.anew.insight on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and threads for more updates. Tune in next time and evolve with us. Thank <laughs> you.